everybody. Um, we're very excited. My name is Melissa Brunswold for the folks who are on um, Zoom and in the room who I haven't met yet. Uh, my name is Melissa Brunswold. I am the um, program director for the General Surgery Residency. Welcome to our grand rounds. Uh, we do have a kudos this morning. I'd like to uh, congratulate Dr. White on a great presentation at AHPBA. Woo! Woo! Fantastic, please continue to submit those. Uh, it's, it really means a lot uh, to be able to uh, acknowledge the great work each other is doing. So here's how you submit a kudo uh, through the QR code. Um, here's how to claim CME credit. Um, so our, our activity ID, it looks like we got a question mark there. No, it's actual 4440, four, 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 please. All right, here's our schedule for the day today. We have uh, our grand rounds followed by chief president meeting and program director meetings. Um, I would like to remind everybody about the Minneapolis Surgical Society meetings. Those are starting up again. Um, it's this is a great place for residents and fellows to present their research. So uh, please uh, let's try to get signed up for that. And then here are the um, the upcoming Grand Round speakers. Please take a look at this comment box. Yep. All right. And then uh, now we're going to have a presentation. Uh, is it uh, Genevieve, are you presenting? Great. Here we go on the rapid eval unit. Here you go. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to do. Um a few minutes to talk about uh, learning health system sciences and our call for proposals for rapid eval. So um, this is our usual um, learning health systems minute. Just talk to you about um, our center and its different parts. In particular, many of you are familiar with C code and um, our data core, which I think has helped many of the faculty and, um, and residents here. But I'm gonna to talk to you specifically today about rapid eval, which is our pragmatic trial unit. We're currently in the middle of a call for proposals and I really wanna encourage folks, if you have an interest, um, consider it. And if you have questions, follow up with us and we'd be happy to guide you through it. Um, so the rapid eval unit is led by Joe Koopminers, who's the head of biostatistics um, in the School of Public Health, and uh, Debbie Pesca, who's an implementation scientist and a pharmacist. Um, and we've had um, now probably four or five call for proposals. You, you can see some of the examples here, but this has been led in, in different cases by faculty. We've had a pharmacist, that's Shauna uh, Steinbeck from pharmacy. Uh, we've even had a resident. You can see Sagar Deshpandi, uh, one of our plastic surgery residents. But these are ideas that um, any of you can come up with. There are some criteria for it, um, and we'll go through that in the coming slides. But these are ideas that you know, maybe can improve the way that uh, care is provided, and we can test it out together. One of the other things to know about it, you can't really see it in the medication affordability because we started to shift the timeline. This is an example of one that has iterated and it's gone through two iterations at this point. So some of these are adaptable clinical trials and they're being done in practice. So we're in the middle of our call for proposals. It goes through the end of the month and um, really it's a very short process. What's your idea? Um, and what we provide to you in this is not money, but support for your project. Um, and uh, Sagar can attest, we've really stuck with him. We're developing an app that's going to be about um, how we discharge patients on opioids and trying different uh, approaches to it. We provide the project management, statistical support, um, also the data and technology support for it. Really... The ones that are best suited are ones that um, have high volumes and, um, and it's a question that we can test as we go through it. But we're happy to work with you as we do that um, and to figure out if it's a good one or not. 
These are some of the areas we're interested in, but really at the end of the day, these should be things that you're interested in and uh, you think it are gonna make a difference for patient care uh, or for um, your day-to-day -day work. There's a link at the end of this, um, but you know, just go to our website and we'd be happy to work with you. Again, these are some of the FAQs with it. Um, we'll send these out at the end, uh, but the idea is that we can test uh, the question that you're trying to ask. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, we'll go from here. Good morning. Uh, we're gonna change the agenda up just a little bit this morning. We're gonna start with our case presentations. It's Dr. Papma here. It's you. Oh, okay. Surprise. Surprise. Fantastic. Thank you. Good morning. So instead of m and today, um, in honor of our pediatric surgery lecture, we're going to go over just a couple of interesting cases. So I'm Dr. Inkle King. I'm one of the PGY4 residents. I was recently on pediatric surgery and I'll presenting um, a case uh, for an sacral coccygeal teratoma. So before we get too far, you know you can't make it through pediatric surgery without reviewing embryology. So very brief, um, <laughs> what is an SCT? So these are a subtype of germ cell tumor, um, of course, derived from the embryonic germ cell layers um, and mostly occur, of course, along the midline based on the embryology. They're solid, cystic, or a mixed picture, but more importantly, can be divided into mature or immature based on their characteristics on pathology. This has a lot of prognosis uh, related to it. So with mature teratomas, these are most often benign, but if immature, they have a higher likelihood of malignant transformation. So that's really important in terms of the pathology. So SCTs account for approximately 60% of all teratomas and about one in 35,000 births. They're more common in females and usually are found on prenatal ultrasound. And on the right, you can see the Altman classification. So essentially determining the amount of extension of the teratoma, whether it's mostly external, a mix of external extending into the pelvis, um, type three extending further into the abdominal cavity or type four where it's completely internal. Um, importantly, as you can imagine in utero, um, depending on the size can lead to other fetal complications, which could essentially be a talk in and of itself. So we'll skip over that for now. Um, so our patient was a newborn female. She had been diagnosed at, on 17 week ultrasound. Um, she had a large sacrococcygeal teratoma measuring up to about 12 centimeters once they measured on the MR. Um, and she did have some mild polyhabdoramnios, but otherwise uncomplicated pregnancy. Due to the size of the teratoma, she was scheduled for C-section, born at 39 weeks, um, essentially unremarkable post-birth um, course. She was briefly on some oxygen, but otherwise recovered quite quickly. On exam, she did have a predominantly what appeared to be cystic teratoma. The overlying skin was intact. We do worry about rupture with these teratomas. Um, but overall, otherwise, a uh, normal exam, patent anus, and had pa started passing meconium. She, we started with an ultrasound of the abdomen just to confirm that this was mostly external and there was no intra-abdominal or pelvic uh, component in addition to the extension into the spinal canal. And that ultrasound was consistent and confirmed she had a type one. Her tumor markers were slightly elevated. AFP was up to 27,000, which we'll talk about more, uh, but otherwise essentially a normal infant echo. Of course, because we had confirmed that she was a type one, we didn't further evaluate with CT or MRI, but certainly those can be options if you're worried about a higher type um, or a more extensive type of tumor. So should play, this is her fetal MR. Um, you can follow her spine up to the left, top left-hand side where you can evaluate or you can appreciate the cystic component. Um, uh oh, I apologize. I'm not sure this is going to work. Not on the way. Okay, for the sake of time, we'll move on. But um, so this is her exam. Um, you can see definitely multi lobulated. Um, one portion, one of these lobules was very much cystic and fluid filled. Um, and then you can see off kind of to the top left hand side. Um, where there's another lobule with some thickened skin. And then that's actually her anus that was mildly displaced to the side. 
So we brought her to the operating room on day of life two, um, general anesthesia, Foley. We placed her prone jackknife to um, a, use a posterior perineal approach. We did partially aspirate that larger, um, thin, fluid-filled component in order to help with our dissection. Um, but overall, use it an inverted a chevron incision, which you, which you can see on the right-hand side, and used a combination of, of course, blunt and um, cautery dissection in order to stay along the capsule, dissect the tumor off of the skin um, and the underlying musculature. Uh, once we could, we were coming down on the rectum, of course, use a Hagar dilator to um, completely preserve the anorectal complex, which is extremely important in these cases for long-term outcomes. Um, and then ultimately identified the coccyx um, and dissected the tumor off on block with the coccyx. There was an additional margin that remained um, once we were able to get the tumor out, just given the size, we could actually appreciate that. And so we actually took an additional margin of that coccyx to ensure it was completely excised with the, with the specimen. Um, otherwise, um, good hemostasis, these cases can be um, high risk for hemorrhage because of the blood supply. Um, so very careful about that, but closed in a layered fashion because of the musculature involved. Um, on the right-hand side, you can sort of see the options for closure. So in her closure on the left side, we continued and just closed our chevron incision. But on the right-hand side, we had to use an inverted Y approach in order to avoid excising additional skin and actually keep the inferior gluteal fold intact. That's also a partial cosmesis um, outcome. And then we left a drain in the sub Q and, and completed the, the procedure. Um, she remained intubated for a couple of days. Um, she was prone for 72 hours to help alleviate pressure to the wound um, and help keep the wound clean from soiling as she started feeding up. Um, we removed her JP. She was extubated, did great, um, and discharged on post day, day 11. Um, this is a picture from post update eight. You can see on the right hand side, sort of the inverted Y incision, and then how that it just extends to a normal chevron on the left. So just a couple of things of note. Um, overall, these patients have very good prognosis, um, particularly with complete resection. And of course, even better if it's a mature teratoma, just given the less likelihood of any sort of malignant nature. Um, I mentioned hemorrhage because there's a major blood supply from um, the median sacral artery that these, these tumors can be excessively um, high in blood supplies. So you just have to be careful about that. And then in the long term, there's actually a relatively high risk of bowel or bladder incontinence. These are particularly high for the more extensive intra-abdominal intrapelvic components. So that would include your mostly type three and type fours, um, but certainly at risk nonetheless because of the intimate dissection along the rectum and the anorectal complex. Risk of recurrence is anywhere from four to 15%, depending on the literature that you look at. Um, but importantly, even higher with um, failure to resect the coccyx where recurrence can occur up to 37% of times. Um, and then of course we follow these patients um, for AFP as a marker for their recurrence in the long term. So this is a picture from clinic um, a couple of weeks post-op. She had completely healed. Um, she um, had overall been doing very well. Her uh, pathology came back as a mature cystic teratoma as we expected. And um, it, as you can see in the comment does include all three um, layers of the, the, all three germ cell layers, just in terms of reviewing your pathology and of course, bring us back to embryology. Um, but she'll be followed closely over these next couple of years. Her AFP is already downtrending. She's down to 3,600. Um, so we'll continue to get AFP every three months for this year and then um, twice a year for the following two years. But she'll have quarterly exams where we are evaluating her, um, following her rectal exam, ensuring that she doesn't have any other complications moving forward. Any questions? Yes. Hi, good morning. Good morning, Doctor. Ergel King, could I? Engel King, yes. Engel King, yes. I'm sorry, um, and I speak German, so I know better. Um, is the visiting professor just supposed to sit here and try to look pretty, because I can't look pretty, or, or he or she supposed to ask a question? Ask a question. If Great. you have questions, I'm happy to try to answer so, them. Best. Great presentation and uh, great knowledge of the subject. Subject. I have two questions for you. If you were following this patient prenatally and it was a type three, mm -hmm. uh, which means a part internal, and at 22 to 24 weeks, the mother was becoming hydropic, what are the options that you might propose for intervention for this baby? Yeah, I think 
it can be challenging. There's more, um, from my understanding, which I, I didn't read a lot about, to be quite honest, um, but there are more and more fetal interventions that can occur in terms of aspiration of external components. Um, you know, the, the concern too is that these, the, the child can develop heart failure during these times as well. And so, um, you know, 22 to 24 weeks is sort of that borderline of delivery um, as well. And so talking about risk of fetal intervention versus um, delivery, I think is a really important question to talk with the family about. I don't know if um, you guys have other comments or thoughts on that. I think that's, that's correct. My, my knowledge, we do not perform any of the fetal interventions for this, uh, but less than 28 weeks is typically the age in which you might do a debulking intervention. Um, those are the big things. So if you can get that baby to 26 weeks, 26 weeks gestation, what we've done is something we call an exit procedure ex utero intrapartum therapy. So we have partially delivered the baby and done the resection, started the resection uh, while the baby is still connected to the mother. Mm. And we have about a 30 to 40 minute luxury time. We can ligate the vessels, which are usually large when patients are, uh, are hydropic. And so that is a consideration. So if you don't do it here, you can fly someone in or get the patient. If you can get them to 26 to 28 weeks, you, you may have that, that option. The other option is because the baby who's hydropic is in heart failure, uh, you can do exit to ECMO so that it gives you an opportunity to put the baby on bypass for a week or 10 days and then do the resection uh, in a standard fashion. And, and I had a, a second question for you. I noticed that you only follow alpha feta protein <clears throat> in the post-op period. If by chance the AFP was elevated and you happened to get a, a beta HCG and it was high, how would that change your view of the, the teratoma and the management? My first thought is that the beta HCG can be more related to malignancy and a, a Sub, another subtype of germ cell tumors um, that can be more aggressive. Um, and so I think my, you know, suspicion for recurrence would be certainly higher as particularly if AFP starts to rise again um, in terms of their overall risk of recurrence. Any other questions? Yeah. I have a um, fairly naive embryology question. So <clears throat> the time where we have the ectoderm, endoderm, and then mesoderm is at the bilaminar disc becoming the trilaminar disc. So are these isolated segments? Okay. And if that's the case, can these cells serve as pluripotential stem cells for healing later? Has anybody looked at that? No, not to my knowledge, no. We could take these and potentially culture them. Potentially, I would imagine, yeah. Yeah. What about the malignant potential in them? That's the issue. There should be none in a purely endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm should, should be none. That's really interesting. All right. We do have another case. Yes. Thank you, you Marta. Absolutely. Let's okay. GD, there he is. morning. My name's Chidi. I'm one of the second year residents. Presenting a uh, case on esophageal atresia and the attending on service was uh, Dr. Segura. <clears throat> so we had a 37 weeks uh, gestation child born at Southfield Plant C-section for severe polyhydramnios. Um, he had some little bit of respiratory stress after delivery and was on CPAP. They tried to pass um, OG2 but couldn't get it past 11 centimeters and that was initial uh, chest x-ray, chest abdominal x-ray. You can see that there's some gas in the stomach, but there's a ending to where how far the, tube, the OG tube can go down. Uh, it was transferred to West Bank. At West Bank, you've seen our team, which is on room air, doing well. Had a vector real assessment, had an echo as well, it's unremarkable. Had a renal ultrasound, it's unremarkable as well. Um, 
Uh, do that raise concern for tracheal esophageal fistula with esophageal um, atresia? Uh, there's multiple types. The most common is type C, which is esophageal atresia with a distal tracheal esophageal fistula. It's highlighted with the arrow. And then uh, traditionally, the tracheal esophageal fistula repair and ear repair is done with the right posterior lateral thoracotomy, ligation of the fistula, and then reconstruction of the esophagus. So the following day, he went to the OR. I had a rigid bronchoscopy at that time. Showed that the, there was a fistula one and a half centimeters above the carina. Uh, underwent a thoracoscopic ex exploration where the distal and proximal segments were identified. Uh, the fistula, the trichosophageal fistula was ligated, but there was a long gap between the distal and proximal esophageal segments uh, that a reconstruction would have too much tension. And so he was placed on external fixation, like a modified uh, Foker procedure with the red rubber bolsters that you can see in the image above. Um, and it's planned for a stage uh, reconstruction. Unfortunately, post-op day zero, he uh, arrested after unplanned extubation. They were able to achieve ROS, but he did get some uh, chest compressions at that time. And he continued to improve over the course of his hospital course. Went back to the OR and posted up day 13 uh, for a thoracoscopic exploration, but there was really dense adhesions. Um, and so he ended up being converted to a right posterior lateral thoracotomy. After going at, undergoing a adhesiolysis, and found that the uh, stay suture, the pulse, the fixation suture that was in the proximal esophageal segment had actually pulled through, which was likely due to the trauma during compressions from CPR. And so then uh, he was placed in internal fixation, uh, where his uh, the proximal and distal segments of the esophagus were uh, attacked to the prevertebral fascia. Given that he was doing well in the case, he also had a lab G2 place. Post-operatively, his chest tube was moving post-op day six. He was missed full feeds. He was still in the hospital, so he came back to the OR about two and a half months later. Um, started off with the VATS, but again, there was some chronic scarring and dense inflammation. Converted to open. Um, the proximal esophageal segment was really stuck into the chest wall, so it was really challenging uh, dissection and mobilization, where they ended up having enough length to uh, create a, an anastomosis that wasn't under too much tension. I have some intraoperative VATS findings. You can see there's a lot of dense adhesions. Um, so it's in the top right corner. Uh, Postoperatively, on the post update five, there was an unplanned replacement of the nasal gastric tube, raising concern for a leak. Underwent a soft ground post op day seven. What you can see on the top right, which he was found to have a leak at the right lateral border of the esophageal anastomosis. Underwent serial esophagrams in post op day 14 and 21 that showed a contained leak at this point. And uh, his G-tube was changed into a GJ tube to minimize reflux, given the leak. Uh, you see on the left was the post-op day 33 esophagram that showed now a contained smaller leak. And then on post-op day 45, as an outpatient, got another esophagram. Showed there was no leak, but there was a stricture developed at the esophageal anastomosis, which prompted him to return to the OR for esophagoscopy. Uh, he had a really tight stricture, as you can see on the image above, and he was gently dilated, balloon dilated. Um, I went an esophagram under fluoro, uh, which showed uh, a leak into the um, right upper lobe. Um, and so they got a repeat esophagram on the 11th, three days after that case, and it showed that there was contrast extravasating into the peripheral airways of the upper lobe. And he was made to the hospital for IV antibiotics and uh, hemodynamic monitoring. And so as an outpatient, he had uh, recurrent admissions due to viral URIs, uh, both followed in clinic by Dr. Shigura, and esophagram that still uh, showed the esophageal bronchial fistula as noted uh, above. Uh, and then we started to do pre-op planning on the 20th after we got a CT chest. And you can see on the axials was a coronal, uh, the abnormal connection between the esophagus and the posterior bronchi of the rubber lobe. Patient returned to the OR on the 28th, uh, so now I was on service. Uh, underwent a flex bronch, where you can see the upper lobe has a lot of erythema noted there. And you can see the esophagoscopy, which you can see the, um, the well epithelialized fistula on the left side of the image. Uh, and so you underwent an open re-exploration, um, excised the esophageal uh, pleural fistula. They uh, actually ended up resecting one and a half centimeters of the esophagus and then re-anastomosed it. And then the part of the right upper lobe that was uh, the parenchyma that was connected to the fish still ended up being uh, have a wedge resection as well. So postoperatively, um, he was oh, that's a picture of oh did I skip something? No, <laughs> what's it called? Um, that was uh, this is a picture of the esophageal bronchial fistula as noted here, uh, and I already discussed these. It's under the blue vessel loop there. 
postoperatively, he was admitted to the he had a brief course in the ICU, it was x ray post op day three, and then getting a soft ground post op day seven that showed no leak. NGT was removed the following day, chest tube was removed, and he was discharged on post op day nine. And he'll be seen in the clinic soon. And then, in terms of some learning points, uh, uh, strategies for long gap esophageal atresia, I uh, came across a few. Uh, there was primary parent detention, uh, one permissible, but usually uh, I didn't see it was from what I looked at, it wasn't done too often. Uh, the Foker procedure, he was a surgeon here, I believe, uh, has a procedure where he does external fixation of the proximal distal uh, esophageal segments and then has these bolsters on the, on the patient's back and you can tighten it. It's supposed to promote, promote growth inwards of like one to two millimeters a day or a week or so. You also do a gastric pull-up, but also will cause a lot of uh, comorbidity in terms of reflux, even interposition graph, whether it's with dejunum or sometimes colon. Uh, lengthy myomotomies, uh, where they cut through the muscle of the esophagus and the mucosa is supposed to lengthen, but has a lot of complications as well. And then uh, G-tube in these stage procedures is ideal just to uh, have ongoing nutrition. Any questions? Thank you, GD. Wow. Well, that was a tour de force. Uh, definitely, Dr. Segura, to get that put together. Dr. Barksdale, any questions? So I have a couple questions. Uh, the first, uh, good morning. Can I call you Dr. Chidi? Yeah. yeah. Onagaya. 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 Yeah, I couldn't, I didn't want to mispronounce your last name. No, no so um, are you a general surgery resident? Correct. So let's look at this problem from a general surgery perspective in a different way. You have a tube that leaks. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the options in your mind for treating this problem? other than what was done, if this were in another part of the body? Yeah, sometimes people just do antibiotics They continue putting a stent there yeah. um, to help cover that up. So I, I want to get on the stent. So um, I can only talk about my partner's complications because I don't have any complications. <laughs> <laughs> but if I had a complication uh, like this, I might call one of my partners to help me. And so we've used uh, uh, the biliary stents in this setting with great success because often... Uh, these problems, once you leak, they fistulize to something and you're going back in and back in. And I don't think that every surgical problem requires a knife to cure. And so the advantage of the new age sense, I have a patient um, who we had over a year who had this ongoing leak from an inadvertent tube and the stent uh, not only dilated him after he uh, controlled the leak and dilated him. So that might be an option going, going forward because these are uh, every surgeon, pediatric surgeon's favorite case, but also their worst nightmares, the complications. Thank you. I'll just make a brief comment, if I can, Dr. Saltzman. So, yeah, thanks, Dr. Barksdale. Um, we actually deliberated about placing a stent pretty extensively, and we ended up not going that route. There were concerns over dislodgement and the like, but certainly can be done successfully. So something to think about. And then I just want to give honor to Dr. Foker. So my mentor going through the ranks as a medical student and resident was Arnie Corrin. And apparently I missed all this, but at meetings, they would go at it. And uh, I wish I could have seen that. It seems like it was delightful, but uh, Foker, definitely creative and innovative, something that and we're still uh, modifying even today. So. Good morning, everybody. It is an absolute joy and pleasure to introduce um, our Arnold Leonard uh, endowed lecture. Just a few words about uh, Dr. Leonard. Uh, Dr. Leonard um, is still with us. He's 93. I just visited him last week um, and he's doing uh, quite well. Um, not as mobile anymore, um, but very much engaged, still attends our, our lab meetings by Zoom. Um, and he had been at the University of Minnesota for over 50 years as a, as a, uh, a surgical resident here under Dr. Wangenstein. And then um, when Dr. Wangenstein realized that we needed uh, pediatric surgery, he sent him off to, um, which is now called Nationwide Children's Hospital with Dr. Clatworthy, another University of Minnesota graduate who was the head of uh, pediatric surgery at, at, at Ohio State in Columbus. And uh, Dr. Leonard had a wonderful career here. He, uh, um, those of us that trained under him, it was legendary stories. And I, I promised I would tell a story every year um, about him. Um, and my favorite, uh, one of my favorite stories 
is the um, how one of the whales, the beluga whale at the Minnesota Zoo, developed um, a, uh, a mandibular infection, a big jaw infection, and they were going to euthanize the whale. And somehow he got wind of it and um, inserted himself with a, one of the ENT docs here. And they figured out, let's, let's see if we, can, if we can save big boy. There was big boy and little girl were two beluga whales at the Minnesota Zoo. And he then traveled to the Museum of Natural History in Chicago, which had a beluga whale skull, and where he could figure out what size uh, tube they could put in the blowhole to put them under general anesthesia. And, uh, and then did a successful mandibulectomy on big boy. And he went on to uh, live many, many years and died of in his ripe old age. So a pretty amazing story. And uh, I was, I remember seeing um, as an undergrad here, I was working in Dr. Leonard's lab and seeing all the thank you notes he got from all the school children around the state for saving big boy's life. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But it gives me uh, ex just an immense pleasure to introduce Dr. Ed Barksdale as our Arnold Leonard professor, uh, endowed lectureship. Dr. Barksdale is the Robert Isant Jr. Professor and Surgeon in Chief at Rainbow Babies and Case Western Reserve School of Medicine in Cleveland, Ohio. His undergraduate degree from Yale, MD from Harvard, General Surgery Residency at Mass General, and a Pete Surgery Fellowship at the Children's Hospital of Cincinnati. Um, his CV is replete with some accolades. I'm just gonna name a few. He is the founder of the Society for Black Academic Surgeons. He is the American College of Surgeons Academy for Surgical Education. Um, he is, he has earned the George Herbert Walker Bush Lifetime Achievement Award from Yale University. He's the past president of our society, the American Pediatric Surgical Association. Um, he's the co-founder of the Anti-Fragility Initiative, a novel, holistic, um, person-centered pediatric violence intervention uh, reduction initiative funded by the victims of the victims of crime act a voca with four million dollars in support uh, he's been recognized by the mayor many mayors at, in in cleveland for his contributions to the city um, just to name a few so i'm delighted to introduce dr boxdale and his talk today is empowering change the intersection of advocacy activism and leadership in surgery. Oh, you've got a... Can you hear me? Yeah. Am I good? Dr. Saltzman, Dan, thank you so very much for that wonderful introduction. Hello, colleagues in Minnesota. Great to see you. Hello to all of you who are online. Uh, this is always the most anxious part of any presentation. Are your slides going to load? <laughs> and so it's better now that we're not in, in the Zoom era. But let me uh, uh, see. Is there a remote that I can use? Uh, there isn't? Okay, that's fine. It's probably better that way. It controls my ADD of walking around. Maybe I celebrated too soon. So I'll start Dr. Kermudin, Dr. Saltzman, Dr. Acton, Dr. Hess, Dr. Lassiter, um, it, and Dr. Segura. Uh, I so appreciate your hospitality. I had a tremendous day yesterday driving around Minneapolis, a city that I don't know very well. This is only the second time uh, that, um, that I've been here. And so it was great to get a feel for the city. So um, so that's okay. I, I don't really have jokes to tell, but I can say that, that you know, it, it's been a, a, a curious trip for me. So I got here yesterday. Um, and I, I end up giving a number of talks. I got here yesterday, pulled out my laptop. Uh, I bring, I don't bring two laptops, but I bring two power cords just in case. I bring three drip, zip drives with my talk. And lo and behold, 
my laptop won't work. And so uh, fortunately, uh, we were able to get to Best Buy. Should I use my laptop? If I could, yes, okay. Uh, we we got to, to Best Buy <laughs> and uh, they don't have a power cord uh, that they can sell me, but they have one that they can, can, if you will, loan me. So it tells me a lot about people in Minneapolis. I mean, they'd never seen me before. They gave me a lap, a lap, uh, a cord. And uh, so that was great. Here we go. I think I should uh, plug into power because I will run out. Sharing your screen. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. Do you need a? Thank you. Okay, I, I think I think we're we're good. So I'm delighted to speak to you this morning about a topic that may be a little bit different from what you're used to hearing uh, at Surgical Grand Rounds. And so what I hope to do over the next 50 minutes is to help create what I would call a, the beginning of a paradigm shift in the manner in which we look at surgery training and the role of surgeons as, uh, as educators and leaders. So um, it's great to be here. I bring you greetings from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, despite, is there someone from Cleveland back there? Yeah, a few Clevelanders. So regardless of what the world says, uh, and regardless of the fact that the river caught on fire about 50 years ago, it's a beautiful city. Uh, on the lake uh, in, uh, in Ohio. And also bring you greetings from my institution, Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. Dr. Saltzman kind of so stole many of the stories that I'd hoped to tell about uh, Dr. Leonard. Um, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, <laughs> oh, it's, it's out again? Oh, no, 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 that's okay. Uh, but probably the most important components uh, as I was doing my preparation in learning who he was is the thing that's mentioned at the bottom. That in addition to being a prolific writer, innovator in American pediatric surgery, he was a phenomenal mentor. And this concept of mentorship is what really allows us to carry who we are for it. It's our ultimate legacy. And he's also a historian talking about this place, which many of us from afar see as both the cradle and the crucible of American surgery. So cradle from the perspective is lots of great uh, leaders in American surgery uh, were born here that disseminated across the country, including Richard Simmons, Dick Simmons, 
who was my first boss in, uh, in Pittsburgh. And the environment that he created in Pittsburgh is one that your chair emanated from. Uh, this has been important. And crucible in the sense is lots of great minds, a critical mass of people coming together who can affect change. And as I look across this room, I not only see uh, the past and, and somewhat present of American surgery, but I look at you guys here in the back, I see some of the best and brightest and the boldest, and you are the ones who will make change, not just in surgery, but in our country. This is big boy and uh, beluga whale. So this is when they're preparing to do the partial mandibulectomy. And so again, I think this is phenomenal. I have no relevant disclosures, but I do have a very ambitious agenda for you this morning. These are my objectives. I won't go through them one by one, but I will say that I hope to describe how things within our society impact our surgical outcomes. I'd like to define a role that you might play as both an advocate and activist and a boundary spanning leader in an effort to kind of make these changes better. And I hope that in the process, I will challenge the department to think about a different or an additional way of training you. And uh, at the end of the day, I hope I will galvanize you in the way that you aspire to come here to be in a place that was a crucible where you could come together with other brilliant minds. Can anyone pick me out of that picture? Why, why are you laughing? So for those of you who may know, this is the Bullfinch Lawn. I trained at the Mass General. At the time I trained, this picture is taken in 1991, uh, just before I did my super chief year there. Um, I had a wonderful surgical experience. But in that experience, I learned that what I thought surgery was at that time was mostly in the hospital and the laboratory. I spent two years as a visiting scientist at Biogen doing molecular immunology and molecular biology and ultimately had my own lab and I looked to do, uh, develop tumor vaccines for immunotherapy for neuroblastoma. But my career has evolved over the last 33 years since that picture was taken. For those of you who are familiar with this man, you will know that Halstead felt that the hospital, the operating room, and the wards were the quintessential place where we educated surgeons and where we created our impact. This is the Halsteadian philosophy. But in the next 50 minutes, I want to present to you an alternative view, complementary view, and I'm going to call this the Britian philosophy. And this is L.D. Britt, for those of you who know who this is, a great American surgeon. And as he once wrote, he said that he believes that surgeons need to fulfill their responsibilities, not just in the hospital, but also in society. And that we are a part, whether we're part of the house of surgery or village of surgery, that we have an unbreakable contract. And it's that unbreakable contract that I'd like to talk a little bit about. I was born and raised in the what's called the Jim Crow South, at the end of the Jim Crow era. And for those of you who may not be familiar with what that term means, uh, it meant separate but equal. We were told where we could eat, where we could sit, where we could live, and even what water fountain that we could drink from. And my family, my mother, uh, who never finished the 10th grade, who was a seamstress in a sock factory, and my father, who had finished high school and was a glorified postman, decided that they wanted a better life for my sister, who was 11 years older, and myself. And they embarked upon a remarkable journey that was transformational for me over the course of my life. Most of you will know who that is in the center of the screen. That is the general of the American civil rights movement, Martin Luther King. But I dare say that none of you will know the people in the bottom corner or the young woman and man here in the upper corner. Uh, if Martin Luther King was the general, they were the foot soldiers. And there were many people like this who around the country pushed the banner forward. In 1961, my parents, the two people in the bottom and that man on the side, the, uh, Mr. Cardwell, the boy's father, decided they wanted something more for their kids. They sued the public school system in Lynchburg, Virginia, my hometown. This would only be the second integration suit in the history of the state of Virginia. There were four other co-defendants. They lost the case. And as a result of losing the case, four of the co-defendants were dismissed. 
and my parents decided they would persist. And during that time from 61 to 62, uh, my parents suffered a lot of stress. People threatened to uh, burn crosses on our lawn. Uh, they threatened to blow our house up. And ultimately in 1962, um, in 1962, my parents won the case on appeal and they prevailed. And my sister was able to go to the public high school. My sister's deceased, but this year uh, she will win one of the American Physical Therapy's Lifetime Achievement Award. She's the person to blame for taking physical therapy from a master's to a PhD program. But she was uh, uh, just a star in the field as an educator and a practitioner. But in the process, thank you. In the process of all of these threats, there was one day in April of that year, 1962, as a four-year-old, I watched my mother deteriorate after the integration uh, suit was successful, worrying about my sister. And every night, my mother slept with a pistol, loaded pistol at her bed. And it was not just whites, it was African-Americans who threatened us. And uh, that April, my mother, who's not a giddy person, was uncharacteristically giddy. She was going around the living room, cleaning it up. And those of you who have any African-American or Southern roots will know that the living room is not a living room. It's just a show place. And there's plastic on the furniture. Uh, and she was cleaning the plastic as though she was expecting some royalty at our house. My house was about the size of this room, maybe a little bit smaller. And so two men showed up at our house, one tall, the guy I knew who led my parents through the legal suit, and one I didn't know, a shortly kind of neatly coiffed man who spoke with his hands and talked with a vibrato in his southern draw voice. I knew they were ministers. And he kept calling my mother sister. And I'm like, this guy's not my, my uncle. I mean, who is this guy? So he, he told my, my mother over and over on, you know, keep on keeping on. And he left, they left. And um, I was happy that they left. A few years later, and my parents that night went to learn how to not get mad when people threatened them. Uh, a few years later, I came to understand that the short man who was neatly dressed, who came to our house was not royalty, but he was a king. He was Martin Luther King. And this visit to our tiny house with my relatively insignificant parents in the grand scheme of things ultimately has been incredibly impactful for me. And I share this story because it relates to surgery and it relates to what your challenge is for me because it ends with at about 10 or 11 years of age, I asked my dad, who's a part-time jazz musician uh, and a postal worker, I said, dad, why did you put us through uh, all of this. I said, um, and he, he looked at me and he said, my name, uh, not what I call myself, but he has a nickname for me. He said, I wanted to create when doors of opportunity for you and your sister and for other people in our community that they could walk through in order to be successful. And I, I want you to remember too, that the reason I did this was that the melody was hope, but the instrument was justice. And this concept for me, that justice is a, a critical in the things that we do. It is actually for me, the most important component of what we do in medicine. Uh, I recognize that justice equals hope and hope equals opportunity. And as we work as, whether we're in the lab or whether we're in the community, we're creating uh, opportunities based on the impact that we have, and that's critically important. Few of us can argue that the last four years uh, have been crazy, and now we're post-pandemic, but it's been mind-blowing. Between the changes in the market, I don't have to tell you guys here about Black Lives Matter, you've lived it, uh, or the changes that have occurred with women leaving the marketplace, the, the uh, it's called the female recession and then the political issues that have threatened to divide the fabric of our country. Uh, we are at a time that Malcolm Gladwell would call the tipping point. And I think this is a time when small changes can make big things happen. And so don't 
underestimate your ability to make change as my parents did. So we recognize that there are health disparities and I'm running through these really quickly because of our time, but uh, health disparities are to me like what John Potter Stewart said, you know, you see it, you recognize it, but it's really hard to define it. And when we look at the health disparities, we in surgery are not immune to these disparities. Uh, you can see them in most every field that we have. Uh, so when it comes to race and ethnicity, we see differences in outcomes for things from basic minimally invasive surgery to the care for malignancy. We also see uh, that socioeconomic status is a big factor that imp impacts our patients' outcomes. And also whether it's gender, gender identity, sexuality, these are also important factors that impact the outcome of our patients who we may not see or they may not see themselves as being in the mainstream. When I arrived to Cleveland 17 years ago, I realized I must have lived in a bubble in Pittsburgh, um, trying to get tenure, which I got, trying to publish the things that I did, trying to build programs. I did things in the community, but I never recognized how impactful that geography was on outcome. Those of you who know Cleveland, Huff is the area where two of America's greatest hospitals are, the Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals. They're about four stone throws from each other about six blocks. And in that neighborhood, if you're a child born, and this slide was made in 2007, it's not changed. If you're born in the neighborhood around the Cleveland Clinic, uh, your life expectancy is 64 years. And if you're born about four miles away, up Cedar, your life expectancy is 88 years. And so when HBO did this, they said it was because there was a Whole Foods there and that people could walk in the neighborhood. It went much deeper than the presence of where you could get food. So that's Cleveland. Does that type of health disparity exist in the state of Minnesota? Minnesota, I'm sorry, I didn't say it correctly. <laughs> um, I think so. And you know, for those of us who aren't from here, and I admit I've only been here, this is my second trip. You know, I thought that Minnesota was about Prince, Pillsbury, and peace. I didn't realize uh, that there was, there were the issues there until the events that I don't have to mention the names that, that really raised Minneapolis and these issues of disparities, I would call them, across a wide variety of ranges that exist. And you know, uh, some people look at these things and see, oh, this is negative, Ed, don't bring up the negativity. But in so many ways, when I look at a place like Minnesota with the Scandinavian history and this kind of ability of people to remain separate from each other, but work for each other, and the emerging ethnicities from all over the world that are here from Southeast Asia to the Eastern part of Africa to our indigenous people. I think that you are a, a state that's well poised to make progress, progress. And so that the other P that happens here is one of progress and prosperity that I think exists here. But those of you, particularly the younger group, understand these concepts of the social determinants of health. And I got a big lesson in SDOH as I began to do work in Cleveland that I'll talk about. Growing up in the 1960s, my parents talked a lot about equality. And I showed you this uh, story of my folks and I, until the 1990s, said I, I wanna work for equality. But this is what equality is. We're now in a time where we talk about equity. And for those of you who are familiar with this definition from CMS, I apologize, but it's to attain, attain the highest level of health for all people. But as I look at this diagram, does anyone see a problem with this diagram? No, equity seems good, right? Help the people, help people from where I was yesterday, South Minneapolis have better health outcomes, have better access. That seems great. Well, let's challenge that for just a little bit in a little bit. 
how do we how do we measure health and health outcomes in our country? Is it how fast we can do a minimally invasive procedure? No, we really measure it by life expectancy. I mean, we can do a lot of great things for pancreatic cancer, but if patients aren't pain-free and don't have a prolonged survival, then we're not really doing what we think we should be doing. So for me, the quality of our healthcare system is based on American life expectancy. And what's happened to American life expectancy independent, forgive me, uh, independent of the COVID pandemic, but accentuated by the pandemic. We're worse than comparable countries across the world. And so in the early or in the early teens, uh, this husband and wife couple from Princeton wrote an important paper in PNAS that ultimately made it to the ultimate paper, the New York Times, uh, on why white Americans working in middle class were dying earlier. And I found this a very important paper at the time. It actually was felt to impact the presidential election. And I'm, I'm not a person that likes to emphasize race, but we have to talk about race. Why were white people dying so early? And so they went deep, they went deep st statistically. And so here's the article from the New York Times. It's an incredible picture and it's really more prominent say in places like I live in Ohio, in West Virginia, uh, in that area. And so they noted that many people were not gonna be making it to older age, that we were losing a generation. And that generation is in that group that, that you're in. And they found that people who were, you know, that between zero and five, the, uh, I'm sorry, the five-year-olds were not making it to 40 at the same rate as any other time in, in our history of our country. And they wrote a book called Deaths of Despair. And this book, Deaths of Despair, uh, talked about this. One in 25 Americans will die before the age of 40. And why will they die? They will die because of suicide, homicide, alcohol, alcoholism, and overdose. So this was white Americans. And this kind of brought us in to the pandemic. Well, what did the pandemic do? This diffused across a wide variety of ethnic groups and groups in Americans. This concept that despair is an issue in our health has become a very subtle factor that I think we as surgeons don't often think about. We're not thinking about, do our patients have hope? You know, they come to us for a procedure, but, but do they really, do they have other problems that are impacting their outcomes, substance abuse? So I was delighted that this came out in 2012 because I had been speaking before that about the concept of, of despair in our urban communities. And when I had gone through those communities and met with kids and met with people, I was seeing people who had fistulas by the age of 40 from uncontrolled hypertension and people having strokes uh, in their mid forties. And so in an op-ed that I just published this weekend in collaboration with of all things I can't go into too deeply here for the time, Amazon Web Services, the largest database in the world, we've gotten access to this massive data and interpreted. We realize that in Cleveland, the focus of gun violence is on homicide, but 70% of the gun deaths in African-Americans in Cleveland, 70% of the gun deaths, uh, just like 66% of the deaths of whites in Ohio is not from being from homicide, but from suicide. So this concept of deaths of despair and the impact of our environment and how we see things and opportunity, the lack of hope, the lack of justice is something that is impactful and is, is affecting our surgical outcomes. And in some ways we have to almost prescribe hope for our patients, seems really corny, uh, but it's really important. So I take you back to this slide. Is there something wrong in this slide? Well, for the liberal in me, no, we're giving everybody you know, a fair chance. Everyone gets to see the game. But for the kid that grew up in Lynchburg, Virginia, 
who thinks about hope and justice. We have to eliminate the barriers to our patients in order for them to get access. Because in some ways, equity disfavors the tall guy, right? I mean, what's in it for him? He doesn't get to see the game in any better way. But when we think about taking down the systemic barriers that exist, uh, we can make a difference. We can have an impact that goes beyond just rhetoric and images that we speak from our suburban locations. So in a great paper uh, that was uh, published by Tracy Deckard from Boston University, and my animation's not working, but this is the, uh, the diagram that, that shows that, um, you know, in, in surgery, we have the ability to, uh, to use these things and use our humility to begin to improve our health outcomes if we are thinking creatively. So I was sitting in a bar uh, waiting to see Dr. Saltzman in 2007, 2006 to give the boards at uh, the Four Seasons in Philadelphia uh, because our rooms weren't ready. And I bumped into an old, old friend and uh, he actually had been my medical student. And we'd spent a lot of time talking as, as medical students when I was a resident in a thing called minor surgery at the MGH. And I recall that good teachers introduce new thought, but great teachers introduce new ways of thinking. That friend, God rest his soul, was Paul Farmer. And what Paul told me, for those of you who don't know Paul Farmer, I always would get on him because he made everyone interested in international health. And there are parts of our urban neighborhoods that are worse than Uganda, and, uh, but everyone overlooks. But what Paul told me, he said, Ed, you know, and, and he ultimately wrote this. He said, you're focused on the fact you didn't get NIH funding for your molecular biology approach to neuroblastoma. But in some ways, uh, the work that you're doing is desocializing inquiry into things that have impact. And so he said to me in, in very clear terms, I'm going to charge you with developing some biosocial <laughs> understandings of the phenomena that you will see when you take the job in Cleveland that you're thinking about taking. I'm going to tell you to take that job. Um, well, I'm a stubborn surgeon. I'm not going to let it listen to some infectious disease, <clears throat> infectious disease doctor, <laughs> but I went to Cleveland. And so what I ask you today is, do physicians have social responsibility? And uh, let's make it more personal. Do surgeons have social responsibility? And what does that look like? Uh, and for me, that is a duty to think about how we can improve our society. And we have a wide variety of ways. We're not constrained to just one thing. You don't have to do grassroots work. You don't have to do uh, community work. But these are the strategies. So some people would argue, heck no. Uh, there's so much to learn and do in medicine. You need to focus your attention, as Thomas Huddle, a former dean, says that you should resist any attempts at getting involved in social issues. And in fact, less than half of us vote. Are you guys gonna vote this year? I'm not telling you who to vote for, but we gotta have our voice heard. And so surgeon as advocate to me means really standing up and having your voice heard. So we know this guy from medical school, this is Rudy Verkow. You know, this is Verkow's node, Verkow's triangle, triad. Uh, but he was the first advocate of what's called social medicine and developed a newspaper in the mid 1800s when he often talked about the impact of our environment on our health and advocated for the elimination of child uh, working, uh, children working and for the circumstances. And so uh, the AMA talks about our role as advocates, but I want to make this incredibly personal for all of you who are here and for those of you who live through the things here in Minneapolis four years ago. These are the different ways that you can be an advocate. I would challenge you to think about how you might be able to support the things that matter to you. Maybe it's Medicare reform. Maybe it's work hours for physicians. But we can't be passive because the more passive that we are, as the CEO of my former hospital said, he used to, not, I'm sorry, the former CEO of my hospital said that if you're not at the dinner table, uh, 
then you're on the menu. And we are increasingly becoming people who are on the menu. And this challenge or what we're hearing that we got to stay in our lane, whether it's gun violence or whether it's about our compensation or our work life integration, I don't believe that. And neither does Heather Levy. Heather is a brilliant young woman from, uh, from Nebraska who is going to be a pediatric surgeon. And she published this paper, this paper examining the role of uh, advocacy, social justice advocacy. And so, so she looked across three institutions and uh, she asked her colleagues, um, how do you feel about this? Interestingly enough, across three institutions, she got a 46% response rate, 60% uh, were faculty, 40% were trainees, 59% uh, were men. And you can see the statistics here, but the most powerful part of this statistic that I love, and I hope it's okay to use this word when I use it, is that 86% of the female surgeons were already involved in social justice advocacy as compared to 64% of the men. So as a, a boy who grew up with two parents who were only married 63 years, but I grew up with my grandmother, my mother, and my sister, who were all badass women. I hope that's not offensive. Um, but I applaud the bad derriere women who are emerging in American surgery, who are going to be the change makers. And there'll be people like me who won't be lost in, in their dust, but will be following the backdraft to move for, forward. And, and what she noticed was the reason why people were not involved in advocacy were valid that they, it was their personal choice. They felt it lacked professionalism. Not really sure I understand that, but they were concerned that it impacted how they interacted with their colleagues and patients if they took stands. Well, here's a bad derriere woman who is one of my protégés. And my wife was upset with me during the pandemic because we would talk about six to eight hours a week about this idea that she had she left her pediatric surgery practice and went into the streets of Philadelphia and tested more people than the University of Pennsylvania did during the early stages of the pandemic. Ayla Stanford. And this got her multiple sites on CNN and time with Anthony Fauci, who gave an incredible introduction for her for her CNN uh, award. And she was named uh, CNN hero and 50 under 50. And so again, you can do this. It's about finding a cause and, and moving forward. And she was an ally. And this is the definition of ally. She built authentic relationships with the community so that she was a credible activist. And she also built credible and sustaining relationships with governor, uh, with the governor and just finished serving as undersecretary. So this concept of allyship, as I move quickly through this, as you see here in these different buckets, can be at an individual level. You can come together as leaders to encourage your institution to ally with the city of Minneapolis or with the state of Minnesota to move things forward. Or you can, uh, again, uh, do this at a structural level to look at how we impact policy. And so as you look at this, those of you who work in this space understand there's downstream, midstream and upstream approaches to problem solving. Or there are some guys who are doing some things. Pete Masiakos from the MGH, uh, who is all of these things, an activist, an ally, uh, and an activist working across so many different domains. And this is a consequence of the relationships that he's built that he has uh, done great things for. So I ask you, ask the leadership, should training and advocacy and activism be a part of what we do as surgeons? I'm gonna ask the back of the room, should it be? I see some shaking heads, your chair is not looking back at you. And so uh, I would say in a resounding way that, that uh, it, it should be. And there is a curriculum that exists. This is Tracy Deckert. This is her program, the CARES program, socially responsible surgery. And this stretches from, from stateside to internationally. But I think we have a responsibility, if not obligation, to think beyond where we are. And this is the framework. I think it's more than just taking a trip, a, 
you know, to Africa or Asia. It's about putting research around it, collecting data, understanding if it's having impact. Otherwise, I think we do more harm when we think we're doing philanthropy for others when we're serving our needs. And this is the CARES curriculum. There's lots of things uh, available. So I see academic surgeons as basic scientists, but I also see academic surgeons as social scientists uh, when we put these together. So I'm gonna kind of change gears a little bit and talk about my transition from this basic scientist to social scientist and how it happened and, and some of the things that occurred. So I don't have to tell you about violence after 2020. You must be living under a rock if you don't recognize that violence is a public health problem. And guns are woven into the fabric of this country. And in every state that I go to, I realize that so many people have guns. Uh, I mean, I grew up in a house with several guns. I've only shot a gun once in my life, and that was as a child. And so I, I probably shouldn't say this publicly, uh, so that people will break in my house or whatever, but I don't own a gun. Uh, and, uh, but I recognize everyone's right to own guns and I support that. So this is what happened during the pandemic. I mean, the numbers we know way up. Um, and what happened as I saw this is in Cleveland, it was not just an epidemic of gun violence and a pandemic of COVID, it was what's called a syndemic. And a syndemic is a synergistic epidemic. It's when two things come together. And you saw this here in Minneapolis. I mean, everything converges at once and things are out of control. But as a pediatric surgeon, I see the world from a child's perspective and I can be openly criticized for that. But this is a shocking graph from the New England Journal of Medicine from April of 2022, so two years ago. And what it shows is that in 2019, for the first time, and I'll walk over, sorry for those who are on Zoom, and you can see here the crossover point, the crossover point in which guns <laughs> cause more deaths than automobile accidents. So many are shocked and appalled by this, but I am encouraged by this because when I was early in my career, it was automobiles that with killing kids and with public health efforts, we were able to make a difference. So I think that with public health efforts, we'll be able to make a difference. Um, crazy things, I don't know why this isn't uh, staying, but uh, in some of American cities, the injuries from guns during the pandemic went up a hundred times in kids. And I'm gonna go through this. You don't need to see any more negative data, but these papers are available for review a hundred times. And this is a study from, from Boston University. In Minnesota, in Minnesota, it's gun deaths up as well. But what's interesting about the numbers here um, is that as homicides have gone up at a greater rate, suicides are really high here. 70% of, of, the, of the deaths are suicide uh, in the state of Minnesota. And I think that we gloss over this and we don't consider the impact that having important Gun control, gun education, and elimination of despair is important. So how does Ed Barksdale relate to this? In 2007, I came to Cleveland for my dream job. Uh, small town kid, modest background, chief of pediatric surgery at one of the country's major children's hospitals. I, I was delighted. My first patient, a 14-year-old boy who looked like my 13-year-old son, who ultimately was a wide receiver at Michigan State, but looked like that son, uh, came in, shot in his femoral artery, and he came in dead, and he left dead. And as I looked and went into the community, I realized that Cleveland was a tough place for, to be a child. And you can see the things here, highest suicide rate in the country, highest infant mortality, highest child poverty rate, highest more maternal mortality rate in a tough city. And as much as I tried to tight walk my way back to academic medicine when I got there, um, I realized I kept getting pulled into this morass of social problems. And so over the time I've been there, you can see some of the numbers. This is what our hospital sees. We see about 60, 60 gunshot wounds in children aged six to 15. And there's another hospital that sees kids in our city. 
uh, Metro Health. And you can see the juvenile homicide rate. Those are just gunshot 40 uh, in just last year. So I decided to do what my friend that I met in medical school, a guy by the name of Brian Stevenson, Equal Justice and, uh, Initiative, Just Mercy said, you know, he said that if you're willing to get closer to people who are suffering, then you can have impact. So what did I do? I, I went to crack houses uh, with the mayor and chief of police. And I went to crack houses, abandoned houses. I, I went deep into the human trafficking. I went to the juvenile detention center, churches. I, I went to schools, rec centers. And I got a chance to understand what I have called what the roots of violence were in a place like Cleveland in a place like Minneapolis. And it was all of these issues and superimposed upon these were other things related to structural violence, uh, housing insecurity, transportation issues that really drove crime. And we did this program, we developed this program called Operation Focus. And what Operation Focus was, and here it is, what do I know? I'm some kind of egghead academic working with the chief of police and working with the mayor going in to meet these kids who had done these really bad things. And we went into their uh, environments and we gave them a tough love message. And you can see this briefly here. We told them, look, if you don't stop gangbanging, carrying a gun, shooting people, you've shot someone, we're gonna send you to Leavenworth across the country where you'll be the bait for older men who are just salivating over coming. We, we talked tough to them. And do you think that worked? No, 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 you're wrong. The lowest, rate, <laughs> the lowest rate in 50 years in Cleveland, our efforts. Uh, we did all these call-ins we, and we were able to, ah, I told you, you were wrong. We were able to parlay that into a $2 million grant from the feds. And Eric Holder, the then attorney general showed up and my friend, Steve Dettelbach, who's now the head of ATF, we dislocated our elbows, patting ourselves on the back. And then the money ran out and you were right. <laughs> the murder rate went higher than it ever did. It was not a sustainable solution. A tough love solution wasn't right. And so what I learned when I went in those communities is that poverty is a big driver for what we see and that adversity stands as a, a roadblock for many of our children in some of our neighborhoods. And even in some of the rural areas, it's manifested differently in the rural areas. They just kill themselves. They don't kill other people. And when I was in Cleveland and I talked to kids in the school, they talked about life, which for them was living in fear every day. That's their acronym. And so I, um, I recognized that for many of the patients, many of the people that I saw, the children, that there were no children in parts of Cleveland, that that adversity and despair had blurred the way they saw the world and had taken away their hope and aspirations. And for me, that was really tough. And uh, because I, I realized that this would lead them to do things that were, were not right. And by the time they got to us in the emergency room or in the PACU, they had fallen down a whole set of stairs. And as, as a result of the trauma and things they had seen and experienced in their lives that uh, had affected them. As a pediatric trauma surgeon, I thought it meant surge response, inflammatory response, how you respond to a splenic injury. But I recognize that that's just physical trauma. The real trauma that impacts us is the trauma that results from the event, the experience, and the effects. And it's changes in our physiology. It's creation of an allostatic load, uh, inflammation, and a variety of other things that raise our blood pressure, raise our blood sugar. And as a result of the things that many of these children see, their body keeps score over the course of their life. You guys are familiar with the on Felidi and Onda study. I won't go through this. This is the ACEs study. Uh, but at the core of this, for me, the poor health in our communities was the pervasive violence that they saw. And when you think of the classic health outcomes, they are premature death disability and disease. Uh, when I made this slide in 2010, I added despair because I felt after seeing these kids that despair was gonna be a long-term driver. So as I move forward to kind of, I've told you the problem, I wanna tell you what we did about it, but what I've found the thing that's tough for me 
is the structural violence that exists in us, that exists in this room, where people are inured with violence and they are not empowered to think about it. They think that this is what people deserve because of where they grow up and where they are. And uh, so I had a very tough year, 2014 to 2015. I'm not sure if this name means anything to you. This is Tamir Rice. His mother goes to the same church, but this is a young man who was shot by the police. And you can see by the age there, he was pretty young. He was only 12 years old. And he was waving a toy gun. And they shot him much like they did that Indian chief at the restaurant we went to last night. Uh, they didn't ask any questions. And um, we were part of a team. I was a part of a select team that wanted to see that this didn't happen again. We developed the first of its kind in the, in the country and in interactions with youth policy that looked at all these ways of developing developmentally appropriate policing to children that didn't involve shooting first, getting a social worker. It's not a defund the police, it's an augment the police with education and with social workers. And this is proving to be successful in Cleveland. The year ended though with the worst week of my life in which these kids, that kid that you see there is actually 10 years old, but the rest of them were under uh, six years of age. And if you see that or listen to the podcast Serial, the Serial podcast, if any of you are familiar with, Arielle Wakefield is the patient there. And I took care of her. And I usually carry my briefcase, a purple heart that is the size of her heart that we could not squeeze life, squeeze life into to remind me that I had an obligation to Cleveland beyond the hospital. So over the next two years, we looked at the number of kids that came into our hospital as uh, victims of violence. 30% recidivism rate between the ages of five and 16. Amazing, 30% of those kids will be shot again in two years, including a seven-year-old who was shot three times. And another 30% would be back with a depressive episode or suicide attempt. And so we collaborated with this big data system, 650 children born in Cuyahoga County since 1989. It's now up to 30 million records. And with big data, we were able to look at the the kids that we saw who came in over a longer period of time. And for time's sake, I'm just gonna move through this and just tell you that we looked at 457 kids. We put them in the database. We did age match, zip code match controls, and we stratified them by the kids who were beaten up, stabbed, or shot. And um, of the 452, there were only five of those kids that were not in this big database of 650 million entries. And uh, we've published this paper. And so the point I make by this, because I want to get to the end uh, of what we've done, is that we found that from birth, they had many of the odds stacked against them. They were more likely to be premature, more likely to be involved in the child welfare system, housing insecurity, transportation insecurity, and their mothers had poor education, and they were more likely to be chronically truant from school. And the interesting thing to me, as I move away from the camera a bit, is that only 12 had had no involvement with any public service. Only 12. And, uh, and you can see that's 2.2%. And so the concept for me, this concept we have in trauma, we treat them and treat them, is not right. We need to develop an ecosystem of care for children, if not for everyone, that looks at how we can look at their environment and their circumstances in order to move forward. So I'm gonna speed up a bit, but this is my baby. My parents didn't go to college. My grandmother born in 1886 did go to college. She was fluent in German and spoke some French. She would never tell me why. She would always say to me, don't look back, you're not going that way. And so I'm not sure the circumstances she, she grew up in. I show you here, what Margaret Mead said was the first sign of human civilization. A healed femur, first sign of civilization. Does that make sense? Well, a student asked her about that and, and she said, of course it makes sense. 
because it tells you that someone stayed with that individual to feed them, to nurture them, and to protect them. Feed, nurture, protect them. So no wild animal or some warring tribe would kill them. And my grandmother had used this term, and my friend Paul used this term too. She called it an accompanitur, or someone, she was a social worker, who goes along with. And so I decided after looking at all these kids we'd taken care of, looking at all this data, wondering what I could do, being frustrated about not being able to make a difference, we began to focus away from guns and bullets to move from the vector to the victim. And so when I looked at the kids and even some of the young adults who were shot, who looked like me, as they say, they were skin folk, but they weren't really kin folk for me. They had different things that had happened to them. And what I recognized is something I'd heard my entire career, but I didn't understand. And that was the quote that hurt people hurt people. And that, um, uh, that resonated with me after my experiences in, in Cleveland, my first uh, seven years, eight years. And a good friend of mine had written this and said that, you know, we have to change the language by which we look at violence from that of moral deficiency to being an understanding that these are people who are injured, hurt, and in the process of healing, despite their circumstance. It was an aha moment for me. So if hurt people hurt people, what are you guys? What are you guys? You're healers. So heal people, heal people. And so that launched a new initiative for me. So I wanted to move away from, from operating on people who were coming into the emergency room and sending them back out. I wanted to move upstream. And I wanted to have an individual pack impact beyond the care we provided. And I wanted to speak with leaders. So I, I'm a nerdy kind of guy, my daughter says. She says to her mother, I can't figure out why you married dad. But, but I, <laughs> she said, you married that? <laughs> but I, I keep moleskins with me and I take notes and journal on everything. So I looked at my moleskins from that experience of going through the crack dens and places. And I recognized that healthcare happens in the hospital and health occurs in the community. And so using... Uh, social innovation techniques. I took the empathy that I had gained from that process and I defined the problem. I did what I call, I got skinny. And I think that if you wanna solve a problem as a surgeon, you have to get skinny. You can't be too broad. And I began brainstorming with a, a medical student uh, who had actually heard me speak at USC years before and came to medical school to try to work with me. And so, we ideated, we got a whiteboard, we had these ideas and we developed a prototype of a program and we tested it. And it was built on this hospital-based intervention program. And I call this program the Anti-Fragility Initiative. And those of you who know who Nassim Tlaib is, he's a business professor at NYU. And he coined this concept in the early 2000s that those companies that go through chaos and disorder and recover are stronger than the companies that ever go through chaos and disorder. And I thought about the people that I knew. Some of them are famous names in American surgery, the things that they saw as children, the things they went, they are probably the most ordered people now, they are strong. And this concept of being anti-fragile was one that resonated with me. The other concept that resonated with me was this Kintsugi pottery. And I'm not sure if you know what Kintsugi pottery is. It's the pottery that's broken. And then when it's put back together with liquid gold, it's more beautiful than it was before we were broken. So we developed this program, the Anti-Fragility Initiative. That's voicing on a wall is me. Uh, and that's liquid gold that people put in that helped me get to where I am now. The core values of our program you see here, they're based on creating a sense of community for the people, equity, should change this to justice, prevention, creating opportunity and providing care as accompanitors. Uh, our goal of our program is to reduce re-injury and retaliation. We want to address the problems of toxic stress. We wanna improve the psychosocial outcomes for the kids and create a trauma-informed environment. Our program is a 12-month program for kids aged six to 15 who are victims of violence. And we are holistic, person-centered, novel, holistic, 
person-centered violence intervention program. So what does that mean? Bespoke, we are customized to that individual. And so these, this is how we do it, but I have a little bit of adult ADD, as you can see. Let's look at it from the infographic approach. The infographic approach, we meet them in the emergency room at the time of injury. We call that a teachable moment. That is a golden hour. That is when the toughest gangbanging kid is calling his mother or, or asking, I'm going to die. You know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And this is a time they may be open to intervention. Our social workers, we're doing our medical thing. Our social workers are meeting them. And within 24 hours of leaving the hospital, we're on the phone with them and their parents. And within one month, we are in their home, in the projects, wherever they, they are, building a relationship with them so we can help them under, understand who they are and what they aspire to be, their identity and their spirituality. And we can uh, uh, coordinate their health care. So this was our idea, but how do you make it happen? Um, I was at a meeting with this man. His name is Mike DeWine. He was attorney general for the state of Ohio at the time. And I walked up to Mr. DeWine. No one let me speak during the violence meeting because all the adult people were trying to get money and things from him. I said, Mr. DeWine, Mr. DeWine, I have a great idea for you. And he said, doctor, I have no time for you. I said, Mr. DeWine, Mr. DeWine, it will only take two minutes. He said, I have no time for you. And he beckoned his security people and they came. So I just kept talking. And he was initially really annoyed with me. And 30 minutes later, he said, Dr. Barksdale, I have to go, but can I call you? And if you can get this on paper, I promise you I'll fund it. Only $670,000 worth. Big. It was the largest grant that he wrote that year. And uh, so the Im important piece is when you want to change something, when you want to be innovative, get skinny, get an idea, but be persistent and don't accept no. Won't go through this. This is how we did it. There was somewhat of a shadow of the pandemic, but um, I just want to show you what our results are. So in the last four years, four and a half years, we got funded in 2018, but didn't start the program till June of 2019. The data you see here goes up to 2023. We've seen 500 children. When a child is sick, a family is sicker. Health care occurs in the hospital and health happens in the community. So we do this work in our home. And I know, seems corny. We teach hope. Hope is teachable. And our goal to do these things. We want to build who they are in a holistic manner. And our mantra is we want to move them from hurt to heal, to hope, to a sense of wholeness. And uh, we want to build a community around them, that ecosystem. So this is what we have. It's now about 4.5 million of funding. We've gotten some philanthropists. I spoke at a synagogue a week ago and uh, the wealthiest synagogue in Cleveland and we've gotten already $30,000 from that 20 minute talk. And uh, we hope to do more. So this is what we've done. So this is what we're proud of. We've moved that revictimization rate from 30 to 12%. We've got a ton of collaborators. It's not just me. We wanna teach the hospital to be trauma informed. So we have a, a training program for our nurses, ED people. Uh, we've had some people who you know who have come to Cleveland to speak to our medical student course, which is called, sem the seminar is called Physician, Scientist, Healer, and Leader. Our medical school students call it the Violence Seminar. But our goal is to expose people to social innovators, to social entrepreneurs, to those people who see health and health care and their role as physicians and surgeons as very much together. So I apologize that I've gone over, but I want to tell you all, especially those in the back, when you're told to stay in your lane, recognize that our humanity is our highway and that there are multiple lanes to that horizon, from the laboratory to the clinic uh, and to other venues. And so I propose we can do that in this simple way. Uh, we can lean in with intention, we can innovate, recognize the impact of the SDOHs. We can educate ourselves and the next generation. So there's a next generation beyond those who, of you in the back that are in medical school or in college. Uh, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Nothing great is built by one person. 
and then build an infrastructure by which you can study and establish a scientific rigor to determine if what you're doing works. So I close. Paulstead said, producing surgeons of the highest type who will stimulate the finest youth of their country to study surgery and to devote their energies and their lives to raising the standards of surgical science. That's what we should be doing as leaders, right? That's what we should be doing. But we also have an unbreakable contract with society. And in a very sobering way, when I walked through George Floyd Square yesterday, I understood more than when the short man with the nice tie and neatly coiffed and the vibrato came to my home, what that unbreakable contract was. And that's to be leaders. Frederick Douglass says that if we close our eyes, then we won't be safe. I'm preaching to the choir, but not meaning to preach. So my mantra, I'm not just against disease, but I'm for justice and I'm for joy. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join you. And I'm open to any questions that you have. was absolutely phenomenal, inspiring. I, I can't thank you enough. Um, and I want first and foremost, I want to thank you for being our 12th annual Arnold Leonard Endowed Lecture. We can mail that mm -hmm. back for you. You don't have to put it in your suitcase. Thank you. Um, questions for Dr. Barstow? Yes. That was, um, I expected it to be great. This was truly um, transforming. And I mean that very sincerely. We have had a lot of great lectures at, for Grand Rounds and this was, this was uh, the best that I could think of. So thank you, thank, thank you for that. And, and I too had sort of a epiphany here in terms of how to address structural racism. After the murder of George Floyd, we committed as a department to really address that. And we have some important projects underway. As surgeons that conduct surgery and conduct research and are in the process of educating, where we see people in this sphere, you know, so we have residents that take care of medical students and undergraduates all the way up to, to our professors. What are some things that we can do pragmatically to address structural issues? Yeah. So did I turn this off? I don't think I did. It's on. So I think that's challenging. And so the important part that I I say about how do we address structural racism in an organization with open dialogue and with the ability for people to express their reservations. I think what happens, something I learned in Cleveland that I describe Ohioans, and I think it's Midwesterners, is that, um, is that people say yes, but do no. And what that means is that they say, I hear you, I hear you, the structure, but they're not really fully engaged. And so we have to create environments, small groups where people can have full engagement and say that I have reservations about DEI. I don't, I think DEI is quotas. I don't, and they know they won't have pushback for them personally. What's happened in this country, and this is political from my standpoint, we have demonized those people who disagree with us. And so no one wants to be demonized so they don't express their views. My father said something that I, I live with. He told me, and I keep hesitating because I don't want to tell people my nickname because uh, it comes back to him. But he would say to me that uh, you have to remember in your life that there are really no good people and that there are really no bad people. There are people who see the world the way you do and people who don't. So don't demonize those people who don't see the way the world the way you do and don't make angels out of those people who see the world the way you are. Create equipoise because when you create equipoise, you can move the world. Um, and so what I would say that you need to think about is how can you create a sense of equipoise that people can speak about the issues. Structural racism 
that term racism strikes a tough chord in the majority group because it's like me saying you're a racist when it's talking about the deeply embedded policies that exist within the country. But it strikes a deep chord with me that people can't see the microaggressions, the macroaggressions, those things deeply woven into the world. And so until we can create small groups and can and not be polarized and not demonized and also not um, make angels out of people who speak the way we do, we can't move forward. That's my, my feeling. And then the last thing that I would say, and I'm being recorded, so this sometimes comes back to haunt me. I am challenged, and I have a, another talk I've given at the college, I'm challenged with this current iteration of DEI. I, I think we need to change DEI to be way more inclusive and change it to uh, belonging. I like the word initiative, the belonging initiative, meaning that uh, if I am a 50 year old blonde white guy, I need to belong to the organization as much as a 30 year old transgender woman uh, in the organization. And it's we've got to think about how we create environments that go beyond the identification of people by a particular group and think about how we can augment their talent and their contribution to our organizations. And that's when people feel like they belong, uh, they do incredibly well. When they're always looking over their shoulder, they don't. And the classic example of that for me, any football fans here? Any Cleveland Brown fans here? Okay, any Pittsburgh Steelers fans? <laughs> okay, well, if, yes. I thought I was looking at a group of winners here. So I, <laughs> but, but if you, but, but not looking at winners, no, 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 I won't say that. I can't get out of Minneapolis. But the point is that the Pittsburgh Steelers and, and the Browns uh, are competitive with each other. The cities are very similar. One has a coach that has been there forever and has done well. And the other changes coaches like we change our underwear. And if you're in an environment where you don't feel you can take risk and then you will never feel like you belong and you will never create a culture that others. And you, know, you understand culture well. I mean, the culture that you've been a part of and you've been able to create here is a phenomenal culture. So uh, don't stop where you are, keep evolving, keep looking at the ways that you can make everyone in this room feel uh, that they belong regardless of where they're from or how they see the world. Other questions, any Other questions from the back? Huh? I just have a very quick question is how big is your team? I mean, practically mm -hmm. speaking, 500 right. kids, that's, yeah. that's no small in, feat. In, in, incredible team. So we're down now to just two social workers. Before we were five social workers, but we are now moving away from numbers to narratives. Uh, we have some just incredible stories. There's a story on NPR about our first patient, uh, a boy of the five that came in, the one that survived, his father was shot in the head and he had a brachial plexus injury, couldn't use his arm for a while. And, and now is trying to play division one basketball, but is an entrepreneur, graduated with honors. So we have, uh, uh, we're going for the father. The challenge in that world, the challenge with our program Healthcare occurs in the hospital, health in the community. Since the pandemic, we're having a hard time finding social workers who will go into the homes, mm -hmm. into the projects. And I used to do a lot of street work. I don't do it anymore because what's happened is that as many of the older people have been shot and killed or in prison, we have 12 to 15 year olds carrying guns who do not know how to shoot and then just shoot. The older, in the older days, in the early days, the 20 year old would never want to go to jail for shooting a doctor. I mean, that was, they got, they're making more money than I am. So they don't want to jeopardize that. Now the te teenage kids, you know, it's just something to do. So, but we work hard. Amazing. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is such important work. Um, and one of the things that that I remember most from my surgery residency is a eight year old who had been shot that we had to put a chest tube in. And she was very distraught at the idea. And her dad knelt down beside her and said, remember when I got shot and I had to have a chest tube, this is gonna be okay. 
And so that powerful story of generational trauma, um, I think it's it's really great that you're working to break the to cycle. Break the cycle. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, yeah. All right. Next is an announcement from Dr. Akramadine. So great seeing you, man. Great seeing you. Life's good. Okay. That was um, transformational, Dr. Dr. Barksdale. Thank, Thank you. you. Very Thank inspirational, you. and will really help guide some of the work that we're trying to do to minimally, yeah, meaningfully impact. Uh, uh, some of these key areas uh, going forward. I do have a, uh, an announcement I, I want to make today, something that we've been thinking about uh, for, for a long time, something I'm very excited about, and I hope you will be too. Uh, we have been really uh, listening uh, to all of you, to the faculty and to our leaders in surgical education uh, in, the, in the department. And, and what we've decided to do is really take our commitment and investment into surgical education, I think, to, to another level. And so we're going to formally uh, create a, an area, uh, a, a position within the Department of Surgery that's funded, funded to support uh, education research and to support all of our educational programs across the department, all of our fellowships, residencies, and undergraduate efforts. And really pleased to appoint Dr. Melissa Brunswald to that position. She has uh, worked with me over the past year to really put forward, I think, an incredible vision of where she wants to go. Um, I'd like to start before touching on that to some of the incredible uh, achievements that we have here. Uh, just look at some of the, the program initiatives uh, expanded the program's complement, built an annual family day, which this last one I couldn't attend was incredible. Uh, um, really created uh, the, a medical student only inter interview day for the University of Minnesota students, which I think was, it was a transformational idea for, for our candidates. And, and, and it really, really goes on um, to, to several other areas, uh, has revolutionized our trainee education and uh, trainee well-being. And you can see many of the areas over here, including, I think, very important, the wellness days, which is novel, and the ability to, to have the wellness coach. And then, of course, trainee mentorship and, and some of the important and evolutionary work that's being done there. And then, of course, to, to link all of this to faculty engagement within education to really be able to pull us forward together and better engage faculty to be better educators and, and instructors, I think has been transformation as well. Um, Dr. Brunswald is highly respected uh, at the medical school level. I know that our DIO, Dr. Culliken, uh, really is, is so supportive and is looking forward to, to growth in this area as well. And, and of course, really supported two areas. One is the, the Mastery and Surgery General, uh, General Surgery Fellowship, which is really filling in uh, a number of different gaps that we have in, in, the, um, in the department and breast cancer fellowship. So what does this vice chair for, for um, surgical education mean? Basically, it, it's an effort to coalesce all of our educational efforts to really focus on growth and innovation. I'll give you a few examples in this. Uh, one of course would be to, to um, hire a PhD level person and, um, and to, to really, in an uh, empirical way, evaluate the changes that we propose to make using pilot data and to retrospectively evaluate the changes that were made to demonstrate they are making an impact for all of you and for all of the students. This takes time and this takes significant resources and we're willing to commit to that. And, um, and in addition to that, really think about how do we, as a department, and, and I would say it was so kind of you, uh, Dr. Barksdale, to bring up uh, some of the history of Minnesota. Uh, when you're here in the day, you forget about the difference that Minnesota has made nationally for education. And I don't like to bring that up too much because I think we really, as you also said, need to look forward. The past was then, 
right? We need to look forward into how we can impact things in a way that is pragmatic and real and tangible. But to really start to, to, to think about how we can really transform the surgical residency to really address what our, our society needs. We need surgeon scientists, we need change agents, and we need really good surgeons. And so we, how do we address all of these three things? And how do we really address the vision of one of the longest laboratory programs in the country and streamline it into something that can really produce surgeon scientists, but at the same time, not marginalize what I think is an amazing effort for academic time, for development time that we have. I'm not saying they're mutually exclusive. So I hope you'll support Dr. Brunswald as she makes this transition, uh, but she's gonna have some work to do and some people to appoint to, to take care of you directly. And so I'll turn it over to you, Thank Dr. You. Brunswald. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I, this obviously has been, uh, I think, uh, I really appreciate the effort or, and the investment that Dr. Nkravenian has made into the role of the Vice Chair for Education to bring us to, um, you know, what has become a top tier um, uh, education program. Obviously, when I joined the University of Minnesota, I joined because of the the legacy of education research that happened here from people like uh, Bob Acton and Jeff and uh, John DeCuna and lots of folks, uh, John Connie Schmitz, a very active uh, education uh, research program at the time. That's That um, was, was very attractive and really exciting. And it's been great to continue to build, build on that work. Uh, you know, with leaders that we're working on, that I'm working with now, like Dan and Nick and Randy, uh, folks in the in the room here and online. And so um, I'm very honored uh, to be um, uh, in this position, and I look forward to working with everybody. My first job uh, as the new vice chair is to appoint a new program director. I'll be stepping down as program director of the General Surgery Residency. One of the favorite things I've ever done. Um, I really have always uh, enjoyed working with residents, uh, removing barriers, uh, and trying to help folks uh, be the best trainees and surgeons that they can be. Uh, that's always been a great part of my job. And I think um, I'm very excited to say that Dan Kendrick will be taking over as program director, um, and you'll be in great hands. Uh, he's very well trained with an education background, has a master's in education. Uh, he did critical care fellowship. One of my clinical partners did critical care fellowship at Michigan. Um, and he's gotten uh, established himself on a national level uh, with surgery education research, um, uh, having done a fellowship there in surgical education research at the same time as the critical care fellowship. So I'm very excited uh, that Dan will be taking over the program and I'll go even soar even higher than, than we've already done. So Dan, I'd like to welcome you up if you'd like to say a few words. There you go. <laughs> Passed. Thanks, Melissa. Um, and I know we're over time. I won't take more than a minute or two, but I just wanted to say what a exciting honor this is to follow in the um, amazing footsteps of Dr. Chipman before Dr. Brunswald, Dr. Akramadin highlighted all the amazing things that have already happened to make this place a spectacular training program. Um, the, this opportunity is phenomenal. And I wanted to just take a minute and tell you guys a little bit about why I'm here and why I'm doing this. Um, the, I the started, as many of you know, and some of you don't, um, the, my career as a, as a teacher, I got a master's in education and was a high school and middle school teacher for several years before going into medicine. Um, I loved that job for a lot of reasons and left it for a lot of others. The, but the thing that I loved the most was really working with learners, with students to help them recognize the potential within them 
and work with them to achieve things that they didn't really think was possible. When I moved into medicine, it was, it felt like I was leaving that behind. As a medical student, you just worry about yourself, um, try and get your, keep your head down and get it done. As I progressed through into surgical training and as I advanced into the latter years and on into fellowship, I began to tap back into that opportunity again. It felt like, wow, this is, there are, as a surgical trainee, that we are kind of spectacular learners in some ways and terrible learners in others. But it is, it did kind of reinvigorate that fire. And I went to do my fellowship with the intent of doing research in how we learn and, and how we measure that. Um, and came here expecting to continue that research, which I have, but really, I don't know why it was unexpected. I really enjoyed working with you all um, and day to day being, it was, it was very, it, it kind of changed my rudder a little bit. The, I came in here thinking that I was going to be um, wholly focused on being an NIH funded researcher and that is still in my mind, but I've the the what really kept me coming in and being excited about doing my job was working with you guys um, and the tapping into what it is you're trying to accomplish and help you get there. And we are in a incredible period in this program from an academic standpoint, from a clinical mission, all the different domains that we have experts in to really facilitate and help you guys achieve almost, I mean, it feels limitless to me when I look out at all the different opportunities that are afforded you guys. We, in my job and the way I'm going to kind of carry this baton is to focus on what you guys are trying to do and help all of our kind of efforts align to kind of break down barriers as, as Dr. Bonswald has uh, alluded to and continue to help you guys achieve the vision that you want for your career and continue to churn out in the words of Dr. Brunswald, you know, the surgical baddies or the bad derrieres that we, <laughs> that we have historically produced here and will continue to. So thank you. Um, got a lot more fun to come. <laughs> <laughs>